verteilt, weigen am Morgen und hassen und neut. Singen vor Scholem, singen vor Breit, weigen am Morgen und neut, weigen am Morgen und neut. Welcome to Alive in Syracuse. I'm Karen DeCrow. My guest today is Bessie Kreisberg, a writer. Welcome. I was fascinated by her books, and after watching this show, you'll probably want to read them also, and we'll tell you at the end of the show how you can order them. Bessie came to the United States at the age of 15 from Vilas, Russia, which is now a part of Poland. She married her husband, Max. They lived together in Chicago and worked hard in a series of businesses and raised four wonderful sons. In 1951, at the age of 60, Bessie enrolled in the Chicago Public Schools and learned to read and to write English. And she began to write her books at the age of 68. So far, this writer has written four books, two volumes of her autobiography and two short novels. In 1975, we should point out that the Jewish Community Centers of Greater Chicago gave her an award for her writing, and she was honored at a dinner with over 800 people present. The reason that Bessie Kreisberg is in Syracuse, she lives now in Evanston, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, is to visit her two grandsons and her son, Louis, and her daughter, Lois, who just graduated from law school the other day. Tell us about your other children. The other is, uh, let's see, Martin Kreisberg, and he's, and he's working for the government and is writing also books and is traveling all over countries. And, um, and then uh, uh, Lou Irving is an artist and is traveling also. His pictures is traveling with him or he's making uh, quite a few exhibits. He's going to have one in Syracuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Lee. And Lee is uh, in the fur business and, and making very nice out and is and is got is doing very wonderful things for the for, for everyone <laughs> and you've got 16 grandchildren 16 grandchildren and uh, and five great grandchildren great grandchildren and now that we know about your children and your grandchildren i want to read a passage from your book hard soil tough roots about your mother and how she yeah. got married. Yeah. Several months later, my nephew and his parents are coming to visit us in a couple of weeks. Elizabeth, that's your mother, did not approve of this plan at all. She felt she should have been consulted beforehand, so she refused to help with the housework or prepare any of the food for the company. In telling about this later, she said, those two weeks of waiting were the longest of my life. I had only one desire to get it over with. Then she meets him. An envelope comes. She says, it is from Philip Turner. It says, I have the consent of my parents to ask for the hand of your daughter Elizabeth in marriage. Now it is up to you to say whether I may have Elizabeth for my wife. It would delight me if this could be arranged. Let me know if this plan suits you. Signed, Philip Turner. After Elizabeth finished reading the letter, she broke down in tears. She could not stop sobbing. Reva was made very unhappy. She tried to comfort her by saying, I didn't mean to make you suffer like this. If I had known how you felt, I wouldn't have suggested Philip. I have known him most of my life and have thought highly of him. He is a fine gentleman, and I thought you would have a happy life with him. You have always been able to do whatever a 20-year-old girl should do. I thought you would be very pleased to have a husband. To please Reva, Elizabeth drank a glass of milk for lunch, but could not eat any food. 
What do you think life was like for a 20-year-old girl then in Russia? Their heart, she, uh, she, they had their uh, acre of, of uh, gand, and they, and they planted every year, and potatoes with all that, and she had to carry that and plant it and all that. It was very hard for her, for Elizabeth. And so when she was married, she didn't want to leave them with all the work. So she did before everything herself, and then she'd feel better to, to go, to go in the place, because they didn't stay in, uh, in Antipolia. They found in Vilovsk. They, they, they lived in Vilovsk after they married. Do you think she felt funny that they arranged the marriage for her? Later not. Later she was happy with him because he treated her like a queen because he was older, 15 years, and she was only 15 years old. And she, and she took the advice and everything, and at home too, the same thing. She, he did, he but, made a good husband. But at the beginning she was really frightened. Oh, yeah, yeah, frightened <laughs> and cried so much, so much. That's, I'd like to read a passage about your father and the Russian army. <laughs> the blow, this is when he's waiting for the Russians to come yeah. and get him. The blow fell about 8 o'clock that morning. Two army policemen rapped at the door. When Elizabeth opened it, one of them asked if Philip Turner lived there. When he told, he saw the police, saw Philip and said, Philip Turner, you are under arrest. Philip asked why. They answered he had not appeared for his army duties. Russia in those days had so vast and scattered a territory that she had three separate armies the army of European Russia, the army of the Caucasus, and the Asiatic army. This meant all able-bodied men had to spend many years in the army. Some seven years earlier, Philip had reported to headquarters about this, but at that time he was excused from duty because he lacked the necessary height. Philip tried to get these policemen to listen to his explanation, but instead they roughly grabbed him, handcuffed him, led him away, leaving poor Elizabeth alone, frightened and heartbroken. She cried long and hard and stopped after her throat grew sore and her voice seemed to play out. Philip's answer was, we walked 15 miles without a stop. Half of the time they had to drag me because I was so scared for fear I might have to serve in the army for 19 or 20 years and leave you alone. The first stop was Kubrian. 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 Yeah. There they put me with a group of young people whose claims were similar to mine. They threw me in jail with them. Of the young men who came there, some were cripples, and many other had injured themselves by cutting off toes or starving themselves because they didn't want to serve in the army. The next morning, the police guards from the army took me and several other young men and announced they were transporting us to Hutve. 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 That's a... Uh, a little, uh, uh, a little village, like. Our birthplace. Yeah. They put handcuffs on us as if we had killed a person. I requested that they let me explain why I didn't show up to report in the army. I told them that seven years ago I was rejected by the army because I was too short to serve. Finally, they let me talk to some high official. I related my case to him. The answer was, they will look into your case. After several more days of traveling, they threw me in jail. I stayed there over a month. The reply was, not yet. Finally, one day, they took me to the recruiting station, and again, I was rejected for being too short. <laughs> they gave me a year to grow and told me to come back after the year was up. How can people be so stupid as to not see that I was 19 or 20 years old and couldn't be expected to grow anymore? <laughs> I guess he didn't grow after he was 20 years no. old. So he was saved yeah. from the yeah, Russian yeah, army. Yeah. What kind of attitude did they have toward the army then? Oh, that's what they say. Terrible. They, terrible, terrible. Because you can't blame them to spend all their young life for nothing. 20 years yeah, was the yeah, service yeah, compared to yeah, two, three. Yeah, it's terrible. Now, uh, the, another thing that I wanted to uh, read a passage was about your relationship with the union 
<laughs> now we're out of Russia and we're in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> and you're working hard with your husband, Max, and all of a sudden you have trouble with the union. Wonderful passage. After a few months of it, a neighboring tailor store reported to the cleaners union that Bessie's store was too close to his and she was taking his business away. A representative from the cleaners union came to tell Bessie that there had to be a distance of two blocks between one tailor and the next. Bessie said to the representative, since we bought this property, we intend to stay here. <laughs> The next morning, the driver who picked up Bessie's cleaning told her if he wanted to stay alive, he couldn't take your work. They were yeah. really threatening him. Yeah. They, 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 they crippled him, really. They did. Very tough. Yeah, but I didn't put it there, perhaps. But they did, yeah. No wonder he was frightened. Yeah. So Bessie did her customer's cleaning herself, standing over a wash tub of gasoline in the basement. The fumes made her so dizzy that every day she thought she would faint. After many weeks of hardship, Bessie decided to go to the union and tell them what she thought of their rules and mastery. When she reached the office, though, she was asked to wait, for the official knew who she was and did not want to see her. The more she waited, the angrier she became. What did you think while you were waiting? <laughs> I thought that it's not, a, not a, the right thing to do it. And I was angry. After yeah, you're working so hard. Sure. Finally, she took matters into her own hands and opened the door to one of the offices. Okay. There sat the official at his desk reading a newspaper. She screamed at him with so much hatred that is, he was too startled to ask her to leave. What'd you scream at him? <laughs> Why you done to me? Why? Why did you let me to sit there? I was tired. And you're taking this long ride, and he just... Yeah, yeah, and left the children alone. <laughs> she screamed, for this I have left my young children alone at home, and traveled for hours to hear this. At every meeting that the tailors attend, they say, why should they, we pay dues if you cannot give us strong protection, he answered. After hearing the official's explanation, Bessie's anger softened, and she said, you can tell them I am here to stay even if I have to do my own cleaning for the customers my whole life. So what happened then? Then, then uh, in a couple of days, he came to see what I'm doing, looked over, and he saw who is cleaning. I said, I'm cleaning myself. Go ahead in the basement. <laughs> and then he, uh, he said, all right, we'll talk it over. And a couple of days later, he came, he came and said, all right. And they sat and sat and sat and said, oh, your place is so beautiful. Why didn't all the tailors not hold that, that beautiful? They wouldn't have to bother that much. So they let us stay, and even they became customers to us. <laughs> so you won them over. The yeah. tough union people that used to break yeah. people's legs. You <laughs> won them over. You know, one of the things that I yeah. was fascinated by when I was reading this book was your humor. You had this incredibly tough time, and yet you, the whole book is filled with very humorous passages. One question I did want to ask you when you describe life in, with a very cheerful attitude. I wanted to ask you, you know, now all the women are talking about how you can have a job and also raise your children. Here you raise four children. They all turn out terrific, successful. And you work long into the night, every night. How, we were talking the other day, I asked you, how did you juggle? That's the word they use now. How did you juggle the schedule <laughs> so that you could do everything? Well, I, I didn't have the night sleep. The That's night what you eliminated, no sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was, used to be very cold, you know, in the, in the place where I was sewing. I used to sew upstairs. And, I used to take we the padding. The padding. You and Max had a fur and tailor store. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. In Chicago. Yeah. So I used to take the padding. The padding and, t and cover myself up, and I'm able to sew. And many times I used to fall asleep standing up because I was afraid sitting down I can sleep long. So standing <laughs> up I used to sleep as much as I can. <laughs> weren't afraid you'd fall because over. Because I used to, when I cut the linings, I used to stand up to cut the linings for the coats. 
So I used to fall asleep standing up. So then your suggestion would be if somebody has to work with a job and also a family and with children and a husband, the you solution is no sleep. No sleep, yeah. <laughs> then you can manage. <laughs> That's a good one. You, you finished up all right. <laughs> well, um, I don't want to suggest that you didn't always do everything perfectly, but I yes. want to read what you wrote about your own cooking. Uh, at home, they found Marty Irving Lewis and Marty's friend Simon. This is three of the sons yeah. and a friend. The boys had set a beautiful table with grandmother's cake and candy and Bessie's sponge cake into which she had forgotten to put baking powder. But everyone was so happy that it didn't matter. <laughs> I love that. So everything works, but sometimes when you have to work 20 hours a day, you forget the baking pan. <laughs> Got another wonderful scene. I want to uh, point out that from what I gather from reading this book, that the neighborhood you lived in was tough. Yeah. A very rough neighborhood. And yet your sons were all scholars. They were all artists. I want to know how you did it. How did I you, didn't do it. That's the truth. They, they did, did it themselves. themselves. Sure. What do you think it was that had these kids growing up in ah. such a rough neighborhood and going to the Art Institute and taking art lessons? I think they saw the work that we are do doing. Uh -huh. And together, it worked together. So they were good kids. Yeah. And they're all talented at art, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. That's, well, one's a professional artist, but you told me they all yeah. mm -hmm. can draw. And also, I asked you the other day, did you want to be an artist? And you told me you'd rather be a writer. Why would you rather be a writer? Because I can pour out my heart. <laughs> Whereas if you were an artist, you said... I couldn't do that that much. This specifically. Yeah. So therefore, when you were 60, instead of going to art school, you went to learn to write. That's... Well, I'm certainly glad that you did. Speaking of the artist's sons, I must read, uh, everybody doesn't know how great artists get started, and it has something to do with chicken fat, I read. Uh, the table was a sheet of white porcelain metal. Lee, Marty, and Irving, that's the three oldest sons, would get busy with their pencils, tapping and jabbing until the surface was covered with hundreds of scribbles and marks. Then they would dip their hands in warm chicken fat and smear the graphite marks until the table was a smooth, dark gray. Wiping their hands, they would then proceed to draw pictures with their fingertips, exposing the white porcelain. They would erase their magic slate all they wanted by rubbing over the tabletop with the heel of their hands. Do you think we should tell the world that your son, the famous artist who's going to have a show at the Everson Museum, got started with chicken fat? <laughs> on the table. Yeah, we can tell them. <laughs> we'll tell the secret. <laughs> now, everyone will know. They also uh, had a great sense of humor themselves. For example, people who know Louis Kreisberg, the dignified sociologist, don't know that he at one time had wet plaster of Paris <laughs> on his face. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. This, should I read that part? <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> Why he became a sociologist, not a model. <laughs> One Sunday, Bessie came up from the store, as on all other Sundays, to clean off the table to prepare lunch for her family. By this time, she found her four sons engaged in a somewhat unusual piece of artwork. She saw her youngest son, Louis, lying flat on the floor with papers spread around him and the three older sons pouring wet plaster of Paris on his face. The son noticed their mother's horrified look, and they laughingly assured her there was nothing to worry about. They had put oil on Lewis's face and soda straws in his nose, but this did not lessen Bessie's terror quietly so as to not frighten Lewis. <laughs> she said, please, children, take the plaster of Paris off his face. It will harden. That's right, they said. We're making a cast of his face. And Lewis, even though the plaster was beginning to heat, was as determined as his brothers. He signaled with his hands that everything was all right. <laughs> there was nothing for Bessie to do but wait and watch anxiously. Eventually, the plaster grew hard, and they removed the cast, though not so easily as they had expected. When it was finally over, Lewis laughed nervously and swore never again. <laughs> was it a good cast, at least? Did it look the, like I don't know. If that came out the cast that time, it did not. I don't think so. Didn't come out good. 
perhaps, perhaps not because I spoiled it in the middle. They had to take it off. So you shouldn't have come upstairs. <laughs> I was, I, you know, I was so glad I came upstairs. Oh my goodness! When I didn't see the face, it was a terrible. What a thing to do to your baby brother! You oh, it's a terrible my, to my baby son. <laughs> well, their baby brother, yeah, your baby yeah, son. Yeah, yeah. In the book, you write about the various trips that you take. You wrote that you love to fly. Yeah. yeah. Tell about the first time you went in an airplane, how it looked to you. Oh. Uh, I uh, went that time to Los Angeles. And I uh, had to wait about, about hours and hours for that airplane. The snow was up to the neck. But I had to go to go over to see my one of my brothers was very ill. Well, when I when I uh, finally I, I was uh, uh, on the airplane already, and they and I I couldn't believe that that could fly even that that time yet. That's the first time for me. And then when the uh, were you nervous? The, Sure. <laughs> when finally, when they reached there, oh, the sun was beautiful, and the grass was green, and everything was, I couldn't believe it. there was a world, <laughs> a different world. From there. so high up? Yeah. So you fly a lot now? Oh, now I love it. <laughs> uh, another thing that I enjoyed your description of was when you went to New York City, what you thought of New York City. Now, you were a big city girl from Chicago. But you described the buildings. Oh, was mm. that a, you like that? Yeah. <laughs> what you think the first time you went to New York City? Well, it, New York City, there is the same via the Mexico Street, you know, in via Chicago. That, in Chicago. And there they have a two, uh, like a Mexico Street in Chicago. Uh, in New York, place. right? Yeah, the Lower yeah, East Side. Yeah, the Lower East Side. And in my many places, I. Uh, Liked it very well. Special, I liked it to see the, uh, let's see, the. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to to get it right away now. Oh. Uh, uh, what stands on the water, you know, grits. The, no, no, grits. Uh, <laughs> um, well, we have to skip we'll, that. We'll skip it. We'll yeah, go to yeah. Congress. Yes. Yeah. Tell when you and Max went to see the Congress. Oh, that that was something wonderful. You went to Washington yeah. to visit your son. Yeah. yeah. And then you went to all these different government buildings. Yeah. What was your impression uh, the first time? American something, capital. Something wonderful. Something wonderful that anyone could go on and see it. But it, because in Europe you don't see that kind of things. And uh, so I, uh, they, uh, I walked upstairs and we watched it. Oh, that was, I learned something there, <laughs> what I haven't heard before. Maybe if you've gone to learn to read and write English before you were 60, maybe if you'd go and you were 30, you could be, have been in Congress. <laughs> Anybody that can write books like this. Yeah, I don't know if that's, but I, I would perhaps understand better. <laughs> well, my feeling from reading these books is that you understand the American system very well and understand how things get done in politics. And I didn't find any uh, lack of, of uh, of knowledge? Of knowledge about the way the American system works. No, I think you would have been wonderful in politics. Very yeah, all right then. I'm going to go now. You're going to go now <laughs> and go in Congress. Next year, we'll, you'll come back and tell about yeah. your campaign. Yeah. I was going to read, but I think maybe it would be better to have you tell the story on how you finally went to school, what you felt like at age 60. Heaven. Heaven. It's Heaven. September. And Lewis is walking with you, taking yeah. you to school. You're going to yeah. learn to read and write English, yeah. and then you're going to become yeah. a writer. Yeah. Tell us I what didn't you know felt like. I didn't know if I at that time. I didn't figure yet. You didn't think you were going to be yeah. a writer? No, no. Though I wanted it. I had a mind that, that was for a long time before yet, in mind. But I started to write in Jewish, and that didn't work. So I uh, let it go, and when, uh, when Lewis, I said, I was afraid to go myself to school. All of a sudden, little 
they stole me, perhaps. So I asked Louis to go with me. Well, when we, we came to the place, when the doors opened up, I thought it's heaven opened up for me. Not, not the school. And I walked in, oh my goodness, my goodness, what I missed all my life, I, I kept on. <laughs> and, and from then on, so I learned a couple times nothing. And then finally... Were you afraid that you wouldn't be able to yeah, learn? Yeah, because there was women and men, but they went years and years, they didn't learn nothing. And I thought I'll be the same thing too. But, but I begin to study and study and study word by word, and it came. And the more I learned, the, the better I felt, and I begin to go to school till I, till I graduate. <laughs> What you say about graduating was uh, if the next time you register for school, this is, you finished elementary school, you're registering for high school, and the next morning she registered to attend high school. This is the last paragraph in your second volume of your autobiography. She was given a half a dozen papers and cards to fill out. She read them carefully and understood. She filled out her papers and asked assistance from no one. To her mind came the word independence, and she walked eagerly to her new classroom. It's absolutely beautiful. What did independence mean? What did, do you think that meant? Independence. I can do the, everything, everything, whatever I feel I can do. It's, it was something, something that I could do for myself. You could sit down. You told me you write on yellow pads. Yeah. And you sit. About how long would you say it takes you to write one page of a book? Well, it depends on how. Sometimes shorter and sometimes longer. It depends on how much uh, what I have to say. I have would you give advice to other people who maybe haven't had all the advantages when they were 15, 16, that they should also, age 60, age is no bar. They should go learn. Oh, sure. The, you want to express not? yourself? Yeah. Oh. That's the best what you can do for yourself, really. What did when you, you feel do? like when this first book was put, printed and somebody put it in your lap? What, <laughs> what was your feeling? What was your emotion? I couldn't talk. You couldn't talk. <laughs> I was dumbfounded. That yeah. you finally wrote a book. Yeah. And that you were going to write some more. Yeah, yeah. And then, then special, they gave me so much honor for that book. Awards, yeah. honors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. All I can say is that you certainly have been a model for me. And I think about myself at your age, and I think I, too, want to sit on a show and present my books to the world. You did. You got beautiful books. And I books. want to thank you for being with us. We really enjoyed uh, this show, Bessie. It was a pleasure for me. And thank you for watching Alive in Syracuse. <laughs> thank you. It was thank just you. lovely.
Good morning and welcome to Jewish Journal. This morning we have a delightful and charming and truly amazing guest with us, Mrs. Bessie Kreisberg. Mrs. Kreisberg is 88 years young and she has lived in America for 71 years. Uh, in, during that period of time she has had many careers and um, at age 68 began writing books at a time when most people have retired. And we want to chat with Mrs. Kreisberg and find out more about her life and her experience. Good morning, and welcome morning. to Jewish Journal. Good morning. Let me tell our guests briefly that you have four sons, uh, Lee and Jane, Martin and Harriet, Irving and Barbara, and perhaps most importantly to our community, Lewis and Lois Kreisberg, and Lou is a professor of sociology at Syracuse University. Uh, you have 15 grandchildren and five great-grandchildren, um, but you've been doing other things too. You came to America from Russia in 1908, I believe. Yes. I think it would be very interesting to our audience to find out a little bit about life in Russia. In one of your books, um, Hard Soil, Tough Roots, you tell us that um, there were constant threats to the community. Uh, more and more, you write, people spoke of America as a land where one might escape, uh, grinding poverty, and where Jews might live without fear. In many parts of Russia, the Cossacks would ride in and terrorize Jewish villages. What do you remember about that? Well, I remember quite a bit. Um, I remember the first thing we had in, uh, in Odessa special, they had to hide up uh, about many, many weeks in basements. Mm -hmm. And they used to tear the, the, the pillows and everything and let the feathers fly from the, all the floors like rain. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then uh, they, they were just f the fear alone to live in a place like that was enough mm -hmm. without any doing damages. And the government didn't. And the government didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Anyways, mm -hmm. and they always the government said he, they weren't there, so that's finished. <laughs> and uh, but when when the when that wasn't there already, it was a nice life though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have here a scene of a, a marketplace in Eastern Europe, which um, I think our viewers might be interested in, in seeing. Uh, let me hold this up here. And uh, one can see that uh, times were a little bit different then. Uh, horses and carriages and wagons and people trading. And I suppose going to market was a big social experience. Oh, too. sure. The horses and the whole week what they were uh, doing, getting ready for that. Yeah. So they, the shoemaker made shoes, the, 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 uh, the dressmaker made dresses, and, and the farmer brought the, his uh, farmer things in. And it was a pleasure. It was probably a good place to hear some gossip, too, no? Oh, it, this is when it was slack. Uh -huh. They had only the uh, once a week, the market. And if it was in the middle of the week, sure, each one <laughs> made <laughs> nothing else they had to do, only <laughs> slack. <laughs> um, you write also in your uh, first of, of several books, This Hard Soil, Tough Roots, that when you were leaving Russia, um, you spent the night on the Russian border in accommodations that weren't very pleasant. Um, <laughs> what, what was that about? Well, they always do, uh, have to hide the, 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 <laughs> like, uh, like uh, not like people, just you have to figure like uh, animals. Yeah. You have to hide it away. Well, they, uh, have, they had a big, big uh, garage-like and store on the floor and all of them there was lying till the time came 
asked to, then he used to tell us, as soon as he'll come with a little light, uh, he used to come mm -hmm. and open the door and take us out to the boat. So you actually spent uh, the night in a barn with, yeah, with yeah. animals, cows yeah, and, yeah, and things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How long did it take you to get from Russia to uh, Germany? I believe that's where you sailed from, is that right? Uh, well, th this was a separate place to go with a train uh -huh. uh, there to the boat. And then you go off and you sit there all like. But there I liked it because all, all kind of the boat was waiting for us. Mm -hmm. In that special that boat, which when we went, uh, the tenor. Yes. That was she took it up uh, almost the whole <laughs> place there, and then they they had a little boat, which one take to, uh, takes to the big one. To the big one. To the big one. So you sailed on the Lusitania. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, many of the other uh, ships that uh, people came to America on weren't quite as luxurious, though. No, no. Um, I was, we were lucky. We were really lucky. They have a boat like that. I have a, a photo here of um, people coming to America. Um, uh, you can see the, the conditions are not quite as, as, as comfortable. This is a, um, uh, a known fact of life that uh, the, the uh, people were usually packed on boats in very crowded uh, yeah. quarters and yeah. Uh, yeah. it wasn't a pleasant way. But you, you had a different yeah. kind of experience. Yeah. I had, and we that, had that was nice. wonderful experience. And you landed. Um, as so many immigrants to our country did, you landed at Castle Garden. Yeah. Um, what was life like at Castle Garden? You had some interesting experience there. Yeah, for there. a moment, I was crying. I was, we, we had, I think, about $20 in there. So they took it away, that money. <laughs> and they put us in a, in a separately, though. My brother was in one corner on the side, and I was there. And I... I was so afraid because I never thought I'm never going to go in, in a, 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 to my brothers in in a, in a, in Chicago. And of course, you didn't speak the language. At yeah, that time. both. So I uh, so I found a place where to where to spend my time. I had, they had a little stool shorter than this in the narrow. And I stood there day and night and watched, and watched the, all the people how they come and go. Uh, uh, the boats that was coming in and going, up, and the people going, and that took my time away. Otherwise, I would. <laughs> and why did you have to wait at Castle Garden? What happened? Because we lost the address. Ah, of where you're going in Chicago? Yeah, in the wind letters. Without that, <laughs> they kept us like jail. <laughs> and that was two weeks. And how did you get from Castle Garden to Chicago? Well, uh, let's see. Yeah, uh, nobody came for us. We go we went by train. By train. By train. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. And w you write in your book that uh, there were many immigrants in Chicago, not just Jews, of course. Oh, people sure. People from all over. Sure. Sure. Um, did you, uh, was there much of a community uh, feeling uh, among the immigrants, or did they, well, they the, stick to themselves? I think they stick more by, to themselves, yeah. only the children. They, they used to fight. <laughs> <laughs> Not mine, though. That time, yet, I was to, uh, uh, my brothers used to, oh, they were. Used to get beat up plenty. Uh -huh. in, in where they used to, in the Ellis. <laughs> that you came to America and you worked very hard here. What, what kinds of jobs did you do? I know at one point you told me you stitched pillows yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. American flags. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else did you do? And, uh, and the second one was uh, 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 pillows in. in uh, uh, and that, uh, uh, let's see. Well, there were there's some uh, pocketbooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pocketbooks, belts, mm -hmm. all those leather things. Yeah, yeah. And I loved, I loved 
having experience with lots of machines, mm -hmm. and I, you know, everyone I I learned and I could work on everyone, and I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At one point, you said in in one of the places that you were the only Jewish woman yeah. there. Mm -hmm and that you wound up teaching the other girls yeah, how to operate yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the machine. Well, that time I, better, I was able to speak mm -hmm. better English. In one year I learned because with them, because there was nobody else beside those girls talking English, mm -hmm. so I learned very fast the mm -hmm. English language. What kind of working conditions were there? How many hours a day did you Well, work? from 7 o'clock till 6, I think. Mm -hmm. That's a and long for, day. And for, and for four dollars a week. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have um, yet another photo here from this marvelous book, uh, World of Our Fathers, which um, shows the conditions in, um, in the various uh, garment shops and sweatshops that, that existed. So it was a very long day. But I, I, had to, uh, I was lucky I didn't have to work in that place. Uh, so. <laughs> uh -huh. Did, they, did these places exist in Chicago, or are they mainly New York? Oh, yeah, uh, sure, yeah. they exist all over uh -huh. <laughs> in the United States. Uh -huh. They exist. But I had the chance not to work in that place. <laughs> and then you uh, got married yeah. and uh, wrote another book about that experience called uh, The Years with Max, uh, another fascinating uh, volume. And. Um, had children and worked in the fur business. And then um, what kind of life did you have in America as far as um, did you think that uh, religion was as important here as it was in, in Russia, for example? Was oh, almost, mm -hmm. almost. Mm -hmm. because, because my father used to go to every day in synagogue and mm -hmm. in even, even See, even we had that group of people saying, uh, let's see, kill him. How do you call that? Psalms. Psalms. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. With the whole, um, with the lots of people. Mm -hmm. So your father also came to America? Yeah, later, father and mother. And later. They, they lived in Chicago? They lived in Chicago, the mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First place. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, at age 60, you did an incredible thing. Um, mm -hmm. you, you went to elementary school. That uh, was a wonderful experience. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> a special, my son Louis took me there because, because I was so afraid to start up school at my age. My goodness, how can you do it? But uh, he took me and, and then I opened the doors from, the, from that school. Oh, it was heavenly. I saw it. It didn't look to me doors. It looked to me heaven. I'm going into heaven. <laughs> and uh, the first couple weeks, I couldn't. It wasn't easy. It was wasn't it? easy. Uh -huh. And then I was kind of sad yet for my husband's death. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, but then later on, I begin to see my light, mm -hmm. word by word, and I begin to write. Mm -hmm. And and it was uh, it was my whole life there now in school. Yeah. So after graduating from elementary school, you did the next step. You you went to high school. Yeah. And uh, this you you learned to read and write. And, yeah. Uh, it's a very far cry from um, another passage in this book where you um, get a job. I I think it was your first job in a factory and you had written your address, or someone had written your yeah, address yeah. on a piece of paper, and you uh, gave it to a policeman and said, uh, here is where I live, can you help me? Although you didn't say that, you, you gave him the thing, and he pointed directions. <laughs> so you had come a long way. Yeah. Um, and you, you did this at a time that was, uh, it wasn't fashionable for women to be concerned about education. In, in, in Waikido, mm -hmm. that time, not, too many people, uh, when they got married, not too many people worked either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you began writing books uh, at, at age That was 68. my w w most wonderful experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I enjoyed even, it was hard for me to, to, to write, <laughs> starting up a book. Mm -hmm. uh, word by word, I had to look some of them in, in um, dictionaries. 
In mm -hmm. one dictionary, I really, I tore it up a piece just by looking up words. <laughs> it was a well-used book. Now, you've written two, you're writing a third now. What, uh, you, do you have a name for the third? No, I'm waiting till, till uh, it'll be finished. That's the time it'll, <laughs> it'll fit in the, the, the name accordingly. You see what the title will be. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, so you're still active, you're, you're, you're still writing. Um, I wonder if I could ask you some, some questions about your impressions of things. Now, you have been to Israel. You've made several trips to Israel. Um, the first was in 1956. Yeah. And what did you do there? There, in, in the first trip, I was there about seven months. And there I started to go to school, too. You went to an old pond? Yeah. Yes. And not the one. I went to three, especially uh -huh. with my children. My children were there, too. Uh -huh. So they were in the same old pond. Uh -huh. And that was heavenly for me, <laughs> with the children and myself going to school. And beside, I had a prophet. <laughs> so you, you studied Hebrew I studied in, in, Hebrew, in, in yeah. Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, most recently you were there in 1974. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you what you think. I mean, here you start out in Russia, and then you <laughs> go to Chicago, and you spend some time in Israel. You had a chance to observe Jewish life on at least three different continents. Uh, what was your impression of Israel, the country, the people? I, I, I wouldn't like to live there, though. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> but otherwise, it's wonderful. Uh -huh. Friday afternoon, the man and the wife, the build the worker, whoever has a baby, the children, they see more Jewish than than here. Mm -hmm. Seems to be a, a much stronger emphasis on the family. Sure, uh, sure. There. Yeah, mm -hmm. much. Uh, in, uh, in elder uh, people, most of the time, live with the children there. Mm -hmm. Not like here. Mm -hmm. Here they have to, they don't want it to live with the children. Either way, the, the parents don't want it to, either the children don't want it, the elder to live with them. Yeah, it's a very different idea yeah. about mm -hmm. the, uh, the value of, of family existence. I don't know, is it better or not? This I don't know. What do you think? I think it's better there, though, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then if it's not, it depends on how, how the health in the elder people. That's right. Yeah. And the little children is also, they have the children who is working in the kibbutz. The children, they have uh, somebody else takes care of the, the, the little children. In That's the right. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's and, a different uh, life entirely. Very uh, little evidence of juvenile delinquency uh, either. <laughs> well, it's not exactly. <laughs> in the kibbutz, at least. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, even with the kibbutz, we were there. And uh, it's, each one does his own job, what he knows how, mm -hmm. and it's not bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they make the best of it. <laughs> That's right. Let me ask you yeah. another question. Um, you seem to have been literally decades ahead of your time in uh, women's liberation. And only now is the women's liberation movement coming into its own. What do you think about this movement? I think they have a right to be equal. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I wanted it the whole time, even when my husband lived it, I used to say, equal, equal. And finally, without me <laughs> interfering, <laughs> it's equal. It's equal. So I, hope so. I hope it'll stay equal more yet a little bit, uh -huh. more a little bit yet. They shouldn't have to fight for it. Yeah, yeah. There's no reason to think that it wouldn't um, achieve the success that it deserves, though. Yeah. Don't you think it's not right, equal? Oh, I think, uh, I think so. I think people should be uh, treated <laughs> equally, of course. <laughs> you know, there is a, um, living in Syracuse, a, um, a leader of one of the uh, women's rights organizations, mm -hmm. Karen DeCrow. Yeah. And I had a uh, delightful chat with her recently. And she said that you wrote sexy books. Oh. What do you think about that? Well, I don't think. Well, I'm, I was talking about myself and my <laughs> husband, so I thought it's not sexy. Then. <laughs> Why don't you look it up? <laughs> I did. Well, it's, <laughs> you, you were afraid to look it up. Uh, well, as soon as we got married, uh, we had uh, kind of. Uh, 
at my parents we lived. Mm -hmm. And that was a, <laughs> the bedroom was as big as a, 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 a clothes closet. <laughs> and uh, the place where, there was no place where to hang it up, the, the clothes, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, we put on, I put on the clothes on one chair and on the bottom and all over where to hang up the clothes. And my husband, uh, and we were ashamed for one another to <laughs> undress. <laughs> it was really... <laughs> well, I, I think that uh, your books really represent a very uh, honest and frank look at, uh, at life. You know, yeah. Marriage, yeah. Uh, family, yeah. um, problems that, that arise. And um, I think throughout the whole work, you get the sense of someone who is um, very much appreciative of uh, her tradition and what it does for her and what she can do w with that. Uh, let me ask you well, another. I bench Friday night mm -hmm. candles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I still do in Kosher House. Mm -hmm. Not now, because now I can't. But before. Kosha house always. Mm -hmm. My husband used to go to the synagogue every day. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I did my show whatever we can do. <laughs> well, it was a central part of, of your life and raising yeah. your, your family. Yeah, yeah. And the children, everyone went to Hebrew school and they all read and write Jewish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think they did the best as uh, they can and the best I like, and they help and I cradle in the house too. Even. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's what the uh, tradition demands of us, that we pass it on to, to our children. What, what do you think about um, Jewish life now as opposed to how it was when you first got to America? You've probably seen an awful lot in the way it changes. Oh, it changed a lot. Uh, uh, well, where I was there, there was not only three Jewish people lived in Dilovsk. It's only in the little town on Poly. That's the, there was a better mixture. And in in my in the grandparents lived all the way on the edge where there was not too many people again who lived. So so it didn't make no difference. And my grandparents was very, very religious. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think that uh, when you came to America, there were just too many other distractions? Is it harder to, to be religious in America, do you think, than it was in Europe? Well, it, it is harder. Mm -hmm. Some of the places you, you, you're supposed to work Saturday, you, in, and if you don't work, you you get can't you Yeah, get, you may lose your job. Yeah, 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 so you have to just work Saturdays. And uh, that's, that's the reason I had to work, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it was a, a difficult time, in many ways a very exciting time, though. Yeah. You see the family grow and the country yeah. grow. Yeah. And you need money mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to raise him. Mm -hmm. How can you just, uh, for a religious alone, you can make no living. <laughs> <laughs> Did you live near a synagogue in Chicago? Yeah, not far. Uh, it was one, one, one block away. Mm -hmm. In Chicago, mm -hmm. but now, now we have further away. I used to walk before, but now I've not. Mm -hmm. I belong to a synagogue now too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, the organization of the community has changed quite a bit from from the early days too. Oh, sure. They need, they need there's more people, more mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. more things. Mm -hmm. I think uh, things like federations have become very much more important in, in the life of uh, various Jewish communities. And uh, certainly this represents a big change from, from earlier. Um, did you ever go back to Europe once you N got here? No, no, I didn't care even to go back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's amazing. Some of them would go back. My children were mm -hmm. in, recently in 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 Europe, mm -hmm. but I didn't, I just told them they should find the little villusk, <laughs> and I don't think they did find it. I think perhaps it's built up now. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I don't think if it's existing uh, anymore mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Vilovsk. <laughs> Did you ever hear from any early childhood friends there? Do you know whether any of them I got found, out? I found one in, in, uh, when I was uh, in, uh, in Los Angeles. Oh. I found one there. Mm -hmm. And that was heavenly. What she, is she doing? Well, she was just working now. She lost her husband. Mm -hmm. But, but she's, she was young, about one year or two for me. And I have yet to scuff what she gave my gift before I, uh, I went away to back to Chicago. Hmm. So, I hope you gave her one of your books. Yeah. I didn't have that time yet. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would know where she's now. I would send her one. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> when, when do you think you'll be finished with the volume three of this? Well, this. It's hard to tell. I got so much to write. Uh -huh. <laughs> I say to Louis, I want to live at least till I'll finish the third book. <laughs> and then I have the t two other books. Ah, what you are You didn't see the two? No, what are oh, they? Oh, they, they have nothing to do with those, though. Okay. The other is just uh, not two. Oh, story. fiction. 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 Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Two. Uh -huh. Two of them I have. Oh my goodness, there, there's no end to your, to your yeah. challenge. Well, the others I wrote over a lo uh, long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this, this one, will be, will be perhaps, the, the, I hope, not the last one. I want to keep on living. It's amazing. I, I have so much love now for living, but I don't think it's any Anyone could understand, even an old lady like me, to want it that much. Because I have such a wonderful children, mm -hmm. but for them alone, I would want to live and see the grandchildren there. It's, it's fifth and day, each one is so good and so wonderful, mm -hmm. but it's worthwhile to live. Well, you, you have many, uh, many reasons and many activities that, that keep, you, keep you going. I, I think it's, um, it's true that uh, after all is said and done, it's, it's the example of Jewish lives that are so meaningful and rich that, that the rest of us can hope maybe to, to copy if we're, yeah. if we're lucky. Yeah. But uh, thank you very much for sharing your, your time and your thoughts with us. And, uh, oh. Thank you. <laughs> it it Thank was very you. pleasant. It really was. Thank you. Thank you for, for letting me have that <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> On behalf of uh, Mrs. Bessie Kreisberg and the Syracuse Jewish Federation and the Anti-Defamation League, thank you for joining us. And um, shalom, shavua tov, have a good week. We'll see you next week. Thank you. of these rugs. And these are, in our opinion, the only three measurable characteristics in establishing therapeutic alternatives. Pharmacokinetic parameters, these are the same for both agents. Clinical effectiveness, again, these are quite similar. And finally, microbiological activity virtually identical. With this information, we, using this information, approach our therapeutics committee and have, oh, did I? Start it over. Can, can I just okay. tell them? Okay. Why don't you? This isn't going to take any time. We're near re-racking for new tapes, so. Nice